Welcome to the University of Kent's Brussels School of International Studies and the second in our series of webinars looking at interdisciplinary interventions, imagine, reflect and inspire. I'm Jeremy Corrette, the Dean for Europe and Professor of Philosophy, Religion and Culture at the University of, of Kent. It's great to see so many of you again. I uh, can see that people are coming in from all over the world and uh, a range of different people fr from alumni students of the University of Kent going back to the 1970s and from a wide group of prospective students, present students and our network of links to NGOs and political institutions. Welcome to you all and just to sort of make it clear that you can join in as much as you want. We have a Q&A uh, ses session and I will be darting my eyes to the left and right of my screen to kind of ensure that I pick up questions from you all. So please do send questions as we move along. In this series of debates, we're looking at the impact of COVID-19, how it transforms our identity, our community, how it raises questions over nationalism and globalism. And today we're going to be looking at the pan-epidemic and politics, COVID-19, global crisis and the challenge to humanity. And to explore this question with me today are three people from the University of Kent. Firstly, Professor Adrian Paps, who's Professor of Politics and Head of the School of Politics and International Relations at the University of Kent. He works on political thought and political economy and a specialist on liberalism and its critics. He is the author of the recent work, The Demons of Liberal Democracy. Welcome to you, Adrian. Thank you, Jeremy. It's great to be I'm secondly joined by Dr. Amanda Klakowski von Koppenfels. She's a reader in migration and the academic, academic director at the University of Kent's Brussels School of International Studies. Her research focuses on the concept of diaspora and transnational engagement of migrants in respect to the global north. And she is the author of Migrants and Expatriates, Americans in Europe. Welcome, Amanda. Thank you, Jeremy. Good to be here. Uh, and finally, we're joined by Dr. Albena Asmanova. She is a reader in politics and social thought at the University of Kent's Brussels School of International Studies. She is a political theorist and specialist in democratic thinking and political economy. And her new book, which just emerged before the pan-epidemic crisis, is entitled Capitalism on Edge, How Fighting Precarity Can Achieve Radical Change Without Crisis or Utopia. Welcome. Thank you, Jeremy. It's good to have you all here. Um, a set of challenging times for any nation and any global community. And I wonder whether I can just open, Adrian, by asking you how well has the political world addressed the COVID crisis? I suppose one would have to uh, say in fairness that it's probably too soon to say. Uh, but certain, I think, trends are beginning to not just emerge, but to now consolidate. One is that I think both liberal democracies in the West and, you know, authoritarian systems elsewhere are, are struggling, that they haven't quite understood the sheer scale in political, economic or social terms, and that no system seems particularly resilient, particularly uh, capable of, you know, combining things like mass testing, tracing, uh, protecting the most vulnerable with transparency, accountability, and you know uh, a, a certain preservation of, of civil and other, other liberties. So I think all, all systems are struggling, albeit for different reasons. I think it has highlighted, though, the sheer challenge to both market-driven and state-based capitalism. And I think it's very interesting how neither, again, seem to be coming out of this particularly well. And then I think, finally, it's accelerated and amplified existing trends, such as fragmented globalization, the breakdown of global supply chains, you know, a greater focus on the nation state for better and for worse, you know, as well as questions over borders, migration and so on that we will no doubt touch upon. I don't think COVID will change the whole world, but I think it is very interesting about the shape of things to come. Thank you, Adrian. Let me bring in Amanda. Adrian was mentioning there the question of migration uh, and our borders are being redefined and, and closed. What are the implications for migrants during this particular crisis? I mean, I think that's a, a very complex and multi-level question. Um, I'll just go with the borders for the moment. Um, that's something that uh, in terms of closing borders, there's only very, very few countries in the world that have closed the borders entirely. 
uh, most countries have closed the borders to everyone except for their own citizens. Um, but given the migration in the world today with over 250 million uh, international migrants um, and many more traveling, uh, that doesn't really mean closing borders. Um, and so it's not closing borders to COVID-19 certainly, but it is closing borders to migrants. Um, and so that's something that I, th I think as we move forward, what do we mean by closing borders? Are we closing it to a, an illness? Are we closing it to a particular group of people? Are we using an illness as a reason to exclude people? And certainly that's something that has been done over the years, over the centuries, that at Ellis Island in the United States, certainly illness was one reason, contagious disease was one reason you could not enter the United States as an immigrant um, in, the, in the 19th century. Um, up until um, AIDS and HIV were until relatively recently a reason to bar you from entering the United States, either as an immigrant or, or at all. Um, you know, and so that's something that, that we see, I think the COVID-19 situation is something that we see in very sharp relief, um, things that have always been with us, um, but, but now we're really seeing them very intensely in this very compressed time frame. Thank you, Mena. Let, let me bring it in Albania. I mean, we, we saw there from Adrian's comments that, that capitalism itself were, and, and the way that we're kind of running our societies is being challenged and uh, under the microscope in a different way. Can you give us a, a, a right. sense of what those particular challenges are? Right, I want to put it in, in, in the following striking way. So what this pandemic has revealed first is the spectacular fragility of the almighty West or the global North. Now, think about that. Our societies have never been so affluent or so educated. We know how to detect gravitational waves. We have computer programs that can beat the smartest human in chess. Um, yet our governments have been having a hard time to ensure that medical personnel is equipped with the most basic protective gear to do its job. Is, isn't that telling us something about the way we run our societies. So also something to bear in mind, the transformation of the spread of COVID-19, which is not a completely unfamiliar pathogen, nor a very deadly one, uh, into a pandemic, is a political failure. It reveals the incapacity of our systems of governance, uh, as, as Adrian uh, stressed, to provide a very basic service to their populations. So that's the most obvious thing that strikes us in terms of um, uh, what does it tell us about our politics. Second, however, the pandemic has laid bare existing inequalities and deepened them. So there's something about our political systems that allowed those inequalities. Um, the economically most fragile groups, as Amanda mentioned, you know, the, the immigrants, the homeless, those in low-skilled service industries, they have been hardest hit both by the contamination and by the means to fight the contamination, by the lockdown. Yeah. How did we allow to, to, to be so fragile? And therefore, the third feature of our politics that is coming to light is that our societies are privately rich but publicly poor. It is that the disinvestment in public services as a matter of systematic policy in the past 40 years that brought us here. This policy mod model that has become uh, famous or infamous as neoliberal capitalism has prioritized economic efficiency, profit making, which has led to the weakening of sectors of the economy which do not secure fast and sure profit, such as public health care and education. This kind of um, weakening of, of, of the collective, of, of society as a collective entity uh, has led to the uh, condition I describe in my book as generalized precarity. So not just capitalism, contemporary capitalism, I call that the pre precarity capitalism, has created not just a precarious class of poor and insecure jobs, but a precarious multitude. And this is why we are so unprepared and so fragile when um, a healthcare crisis hits in. So, um, thank you. That's 
I, th I think it's really useful in, in, in framing the inequalities and what, is, and what COVID is exposing. Adrian, in, in many sense, what Albania is indicating is that COVID-19 is not just a biological health crisis, but it's a health check on our political systems. What do you see as, uh, as the challenges to the very structure of our political states? So I think one of the, you know, tensions it, it exposes uh, very, very, I think, clearly is that, you know, there's a tendency for democracies, you know, to go one of two ways. Um, either technocracy, where you have a sort of, you know, self-proclaimed enlightened elite that knows best and dictates to everyone else. And we can see examples in all sorts of different uh, liberal democracies around the world. Or else a kind of slide into what I call in, in the demons of liberal democracy, demagogy, you know, just basically demagogic type populism. Um, and, and, and the trouble is, you know, both have got their strengths and their weaknesses. I mean, technocracy is something which does use expertise. And we all know just how important expertise is, not least in such a crisis, where you want the best experts, all right, the best medical and other experts to give you the advice and you want government to, to, to listen and to and to learn and to use that advice. On the other hand, it can't just be technocracy, you need judgment. You need good political judgment that essentially makes the, the, the decisive calls. It can't just be the scientists, but nor can it be left to people who appeal to, you know, to base instinct, to things like the will of the people as if somehow the people were a monolith. You know, the people are, are not a monolith. They're very diverse in, in terms of their needs and interests. So how can we steer a course between technocracy and, and populism? I think that is one of the key challenges. I think a form of democratic pluralism is more corporatist, where, for instance, government, the trade unions and business, you know, work together much more, is now vital because we cannot manage this crisis like we managed the financial crisis or else the banks get away, got away lightly and look what happened. The economy did not go back to strong growth you know, and, and, and better employment and so on. So we need to tackle those root causes. And that can only be done if you have a democracy that's more participatory, but also where different interests are generally brought together. And I think for authoritarian systems, you know, they have their own challenges because they themselves use technocracy and they themselves use populism. So yes, they are different in constitutional and other terms, but they face quite interestingly similar challenges. I don't think anyone comes out very well. I mean, I think countries like South Korea, you know, come out quite well because they've got a strong sense of cohesion. They've got mass testing and tracing, and they've been able to maintain a level of democracy, which I think is admirable. So, you know, there are good examples as well. Uh, but I don't think the dominant ones, I don't think the US or China are the model that everyone now thinks they should, they should emulate, just the opposite. Um, Amanda, if I'm going to bring you in there, I see that you, you're uh, res responding to, to that. I mean, do, 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 are you in agreement that somehow the, the, the political system is, is actually failing? Um, I mean, it's certainly hard to say that our political system is failing um, when I think, as, as Adrian said, I, I think in some ways it's too early to tell. Uh, we, we're going to have to wait a little bit to, to know that. One of the things that I think that's been very interesting is to see how centralized governments versus federal governments have been responding to this. Um, that's certainly something that, that uh, I, for one, was, was pleasantly surprised when the very federal uh, system of Belgium uh, did and has continued to act uh, with with one voice. They have very very long meetings here uh, to to talk through and to agree on on the next uh, phases. But they do that. Um, the United States, on the other hand, um, never has our federalism uh, been as strong and as clear um, as it is today. Um, that uh, President Trump has. Uh, been somewhat confusing uh, in saying that the federal government would give, give guidance and then not give guidance. Um, and state governors and state governments are, are very much taking up that, uh, that challenge. Um, and in, in many ways, that's something that I, th I think um, it is the smaller units um, of government that are really, really governing. T.H. Uh, Marshall uh, said that citizenship and engagement in government is important at both the national and the local level. And I think that's something that we are seeing very strongly, that the different levels of government are really coming through uh, quite clearly. Um, here in Brussels, um, and certainly in the United States and elsewhere as well, um, you see cities that are requiring mask wearing. Uh, you see states that are requiring mask wearing. Um, and that's something that it, it, the, you have a different level of, of governance in, in, in all of that. And so I think that's something that, uh, that I, I think uh, simply saying, uh, on balance, our political system has failed. I, I think it is too early to say that. Um, but I think we, we certainly do have very clear examples of where things have worked very well and, and where they're not working well. 
So, so we're seeing uh, strengths and weaknesses in, 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 in the crisis. And I, I have some questions that I, I can see that are coming in. And one, perhaps just to kind of follow through this line of discussion from uh, Albana's point is a response to uh, Albana from some, somebody called Anthony is asking, is the weakness of the West really a new revelation? And does the rise of popularism not reveal how fragile political in institutions were? Albana, do you want to start that one off? Yes, thank you. Um, in fact, this is exactly the main uh, message in my book, which was published in January. So indeed, that preceded uh, the pandemic, that we had become, as a society, very fragile. Uh, so yes, I confirmed that Anthony is right. Um, this is a very deep-seated fragility that is simply exploding now in our face. And, and, and how do you think that the question of popularism is shaping the, the response to the crisis itself? Um, you see, I do not see populism as, as, as just, I, I hate that word populism, I do not use it in my word, because I believe that this uh, massive wave of, of anger uh, with um, uh, the, the political and social system actually expressed a desire for stability, for political, cultural, social, economic stability. So um, this is, uh, in my mind, what has been nourishing the anger of, of, of people. And um, some political forces, some nefarious political forces, of course, gave it the language of xenophobia. But uh, I believe what is ultimately has been driving this discontent has been this massive destabilization. I, I suppose when we get to the question of, of, of popularism, it brings us back in some ways to your points, Adrian, about political systems and, and, the, and the issue of the new nationalistic responses in, 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 the, in the crisis. And, and I, I note that uh, Samantha Powers in, in, in a New York Times article was responding to the question that we have to survive this together. We are, we are interconnected. What are the tensions between the global agenda, the globalist agenda, and that of the nationalist agenda in the response to COVID-19? Well, I mean, maybe, you know, to preface my, my, my response uh, by, by saying that, yes, I think we do have to distinguish, uh, as Albana just, just uh, you know, intimated, between, on the one hand, you know, a huge popular anger that's been driving, you know, uh, the, the kind of electoral success of figures like Trump or the Brexit vote or, you know, Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil and, you know, and many others, uh, including the, the, you know, the, the governing parties in Hungary, uh, Poland or, or India, you know, and so on. Uh, and on the other hand, you know, the, the, the leaders, the insurgents, you know, who then, you know, use that anger for, for purposes that aren't necessarily in line with the interests and needs of the people who've just expressed their anger. So I think there's... A, there's a huge disconnect there between insurgent elites and the people who vote for them, right? Just like you might say on the other side, uh, you know, there are, there are a mass of people who vote for more technocratic, say, liberal elites, and those liberal elites don't always act in, you know, in the, in the best interests of the people who voted for them. So, you know, the, the whole question of elites uh, versus people, of, of course, remains you know, an absolute crucial distinction. And in that sense, yes, populism is potentially very misleading because often populism is more of a method or it's a response by insurgent leaders rather than reflective of, you know, the, the values or, 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 or so of the people who, who make those electoral choices. But, but to come back to your question, Jeremy, and I think it does, you know, is closely related. Um, so on the one hand, globalism, you know, uh, is not having a good crisis, as it were, if I can put it in slightly more flippant terms, because, you know, so much of multi lateral cooperation that we might have seen in the 90s or even after the global financial crash, you know, when the G20 came together to kind of recapitalize banks and, and, and launch bailouts and, and, and recovery programs, you know, isn't happening this time around. On the other hand, we also know that global cooperation is absolutely vital to find a vaccine, you know, to trace things that obviously cross borders and, and so on. So there's a huge tension there between the need for international cooperation on the one hand and the failure of existing multilateral channels or mechanisms or the lack of political will to, to use those institutions. And then I think the, the thing with nationalism again is very uh, problematic because on the one hand, there are some very dangerous nationalist forces out there, right? Clearly in, in, in a variety of countries, in the West, in the East, in the North, in the South, that, that, that's, that's absolutely right. On the other hand, I don't think there are majority forces in most countries. I think there are small vocal groups 
that are again using this huge anger for their own purposes. So I think, you know, I wouldn't want to be in a situation where we start labeling everyone who votes for certain parties, you know, nationalist or xenophobic or racist, because I don't think that's quite the case. But nationalism is not, you know, somehow uh, to be taken lightly. Where it happens, where it's mobilized, where it's part of state power, it is incredibly dangerous. And, and European and, you know, and global history teaches us, you know, now that we've just lived through the 75th anniversary of the end of the Second World War, we know where nationalism leads when it remains unchallenged. So, you know, so I think both globalism and nationalism as ideologies have their huge uh, threats and dangers, and we do need to confront them. But what we do need is good international cooperation, coupled with a strong sense of national and regional and local community. We want to somehow bring the good internationalism together with the good localism, if you like. Uh, thank you. And I suppose in, in relationship to this, a, a question from Jenny is, uh, is the current crisis indicative of the need of, uh, for globalization because we cannot solve it alone or its problems in, are exacerbating the spread? Amanda, are you in, in agreement with this uh, sense that of a need for more globalization that, that, that Jenny is suggesting? I mean, I think in a lot of ways, it's, it's not an either or question, because that's something that, uh, that t we, we have a bit of, bit of both of that, right? Um, I, but I'll come back to that. But I just wanted to pick up on something Albina said earlier about the, this relationship between populism and xenophobia. Um, and I think, you're, I think you're absolutely right, Albina, that, the, that uh, it's precarity and, and fear. Uh, that drives people to voting for particular parties. Uh, and, and migrants or, or ethnic minorities or, or both have always been a, a useful scapegoat, right? It's the other, it's an outgroup. I mean, that's, that's, we've, we've seen that, that uh, in, in many countries over, over, over great periods of time. Um, and, and right now, that's certainly something that, that we are, we are also, also seeing, right? Um, and and to, to link to that, um, the, the UK has flown in a plane load full of Romanian workers uh, to collect the harvest because there weren't enough people willing to do the harvest, even among those people who were furloughed. Um, and so that's something that in response to Jenny's question, this question about globalization, whatever forms that takes, but we're going to just talk briefly about, about broad networking, uh, that I, I think we, we see it in many different ways, uh, that we do rely on, on, on each other, um, that, that uh, we have outsourced ma manufacturing uh, to many other countries, uh, largely China, but not only. Um, you know, and, and to a certain extent, we need to think about uh, are we now going to nationalize certain industries or are we going to take globalization more seriously uh, and get more behind it? And, and I, I think it's not an either or question. Um, and and it's a, perhaps it's a bit of a, a cop out, but I also hear I think it is too early to tell. Um, right now, uh, governments are trying to, to sort this out. Um, blame is going to follow. Um, it's already following. Um, and then at a certain point, once that, once that sort, of, sort of falls out and once we're able to move beyond that, um, then we will hopefully be able to pick up the best parts of globalization, um, the parts that benefit uh, people um, and, and perhaps shift away from the profit-driven aspects of, of globalization. Um, but we have to see, and that's something where we really need to see. That's where when, when Adrian says that perhaps it's too early to tell if this is a political success or failure, um, that these are the, some of the bigger questions um, that Jenny quite rightly raises um, that we might be able to measure whether, whether this has been a success or a failure in, for the political systems. Right. So thank you, Amanda. I, I think that what, what we're getting into now is the complexity of, of, of the issues that, that, that COVID is exposing. It comes back to a, Al, Albania, and we have a question here related to, to this, this, the, this, these tensions, and, and that's from Alexander. Is now the time to consider the idea of a, an, a universal, universal basic income, given that we now know many jobs were, were low paid and not very secure? Albain, did you want to address that? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, see, universal basic income would bring in economic independence to people, it will uh, empower them. But it would be nothing. It will be a waste of money unless we strengthen the public service. None of us are rich enough to pay uh, for, for, for the nest, to make the necessary investment in science and, and, and health. Right? For this, we need massive investment of money into uh, medical uh, research, uh, into procurement of expensive machinery. So first we need to, to, to secure the, the public 
service, and then think about empowering people. And that's, that's another thing I'm, I hope very much we do not go back into this obsession with um, growth in the redistribution. If we would change something, I hope that we would move away from uh, that um, magical formula of the past. Because we might um, create very equal societies, and everybody gets uh, equal societies or very, you know, everybody gets their universal basic income. But these societies might still uh, remain very fragile if we do not have public investment in the essential things like education, healthcare, safety, um, um, even culture. So uh, this, th this would be my answer to the, to the question of... Uh, universal basic um, income, uh, yes, but there are more important things before that. Thank, thank you. And Adrian, I could see you nod, nodding in, in response to, to, to Arbena's comments. And is, is, is this a, a really exposing our, our social infrastructures? Uh, absolutely. And I think what's so interesting is that, you know, trends that have been decades in the making, such as, you know, the either the you know, the weakening of the state for some time, but really in the end, the collusion and the convergence of certain state and market institutions at the expense of society, you know, that's been brutally exposed as leaving us defenseless, you know, leaving us without any civic immunity, leaving us without any strong social infrastructure when such a, you know, a natural disaster happens. Uh, and the financial crash, you know, pointed to that. But again, the wrong lessons were learned. All that happened is that the state bailed out the banks uh, and, and, you know, structurally, nothing much changed at all. A little bit of re-regulation and, you know, slightly higher capital requirements, but that was, you know, a drop in the ocean, which, by the way, someone like Trump has, has partly reversed. So, you know, we know that these, you know, timid reforms uh, that happened at the time of the financial crisis were, were far from sufficient to deal with the real issue. So, yes, what we need to build up are two things. Social infrastructure, that's why I would say a basic uh, universal infrastructure is far more important than the basic universal income, but also civic institutions that give people agency and meaning and purpose. Because it's the case that lots of people feel powerless, helpless, you know, they are full of anger for those reasons. There's no workplace democracy or, you know, not, not nearly enough. And if you then take work away from people and just pay them a basic income for them to essentially uh, stay home and maybe engage in some voluntary activity, that's not going to really you know, inject more democracy, more pluralism and, and more corporatism mm. to our systems. Just, just the opposite. It might actually leave us more atomized, more mm. isolated. And, and that's just the opposite of what we need. Yes, at the moment, we are all in protective isolation. We are all confined to homes or, you know, largely confined to our homes. But we're rediscovering the importance of relationships, you know, the people closest to us that, you know, we, we are almost forced to go on with. It's difficult. There are all sorts of, you know, things, you know, difficult things happening, including domestic abuse, which is terrible. But we also realize that local relations are really important. Streets are organizing through WhatsApp groups and other things. Mutual societies are, are, are you know, cropping up again. And so as we realize the importance of relations and institutions, we need to really strengthen those. If we don't, then we'll be in a similar crisis in, in you know, five years or 10 years, or indeed when the next pandemic strikes, which could be you know, in the winter or, or next year. Yeah, I, I think this is touched upon on a question from Andrew, who, who's saying on, on the theme that we must survive together that this assumes certain policy choices and that the devotion of resources on, on an immediate emergency, uh, raising the question of the, uh, the immediate question of saving lives. I mean, it, the, the question of saving life is, is, is in its one sense, redefining the policy choices. Do you, do you think that's, that, that's the case, Adrian? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think the profound sort of ethical and even anthropological questions that this crisis raises is all about, you know, what makes us human? And we've now discovered that it's not, you know, the will to be, you know, perfect in terms of, you know, artificial intelligence and eliminating mortality or aging or, you know, any of those very sort of utopian ideas that are being bandied around. Uh, that actually, what makes us human is, is our frailty, is our basic human frailty. And at the same time, also an extraordinary human resilience that people can overcome the greatest levels of friendship when they stick together, when they work together, whether it's as, fa as families or communities or, you know, neighborhoods, and at regions and nations, and indeed nations working together. So it, there are also paradoxical things being, being thrown up by this. But I think this idea of a basic human desire for solidarity has, has come through very, very clearly. And the question is what institutions and what sort of politics and what economic 
and social organization can reflect that, that human desire for, for solidarity. And I think that's really striking. I guess the question of solidarity here is, is, is threatened by the question of who's excluded and the excluded communities. And, and we have a question here that's directed specifically to, to uh, um, Amanda from Carolina. Um, and she's asking uh, around this crisis, how uh, can you say in relationship to the COVID-19 crisis has reshaped the mi migration crisis, transnationalism and government approach towards migrants? Do you want to pick that, just explain sure. a little bit more about your uh, reflections on, on migration in, in response to Carolina's question? Absolutely. Thank you, Jeremy. And thank you, Carolina, for the question. Um, I mean, I think that that's a, that's a very interesting point. Um, and the, the decision of Italy to regularize uh, a number of, of undocumented workers working in the agricultural industry is a really, really interesting one. And that actually goes back to previous national policy. Italy, along with Greece, Spain, and Portugal, tended to have a policy of undocumented workers would arrive in Italy, and periodically uh, the Southern European countries would have regularization procedures. And you could then receive a leave to remain in that country if you could demonstrate that you'd had a job. So what's interesting is that the integration into the economy came first, and then the regularization permit came after that. And that's something that then after Schengen was introduced and, and really solidified, it was around 2005, um, that you had the last mass regularization in Southern Europe, and in particular France said no more. Um, that this is now that we have a common area of movement, you can't do that. Um, and so that's something that, that has largely stopped in the past 15 years. Um, but, that, but that's something that really was uh, integration first and permission to reside afterward. Um, and so it sort of flips, and then now we have it the other way around. Um, that we have people who come and then they fall into this economic precarity that Alban is talking about. And so it's really, really interesting that Italy now is, is going back to a, a previous procedure. Um, and it's absolutely clear that migrants are among those who are the most excluded, but they're also the most needed. Um, that they are disproportionately represented in the front-facing jobs. They are disproportionately in the healthcare service. Uh, Boris Johnson spoke about the nurses who cared for him when he was in the hospital. They were two migrants, one from New Zealand from the Commonwealth and one from Portugal from the EU. Um, and that's something uh, that, that really does come out very clearly. Up to one third of the NHS were, were uh, EU migrants. Um, and that's something that in my book, when I talk about migrants or expatriates, we tend to think of people from the global south as being migrants and people from the global north as being expatriates. But that's something that, that very clearly uh, is, is coming out is, is not necessarily a, a strong distinction. Um, that when we think about precarity and we think about access and we think about, about all of these, the, these types of things, um, that, that yes, I, I do think the crisis is, is reshaping um, the way we think about migration. Um, and, and, it, and in some ways, it's, it's even more pointed. In other ways, it's, it's fallen into, into a sort of a, a lesser uh, a position of lesser importance. Um, we, will, we will come out of this being, being aware of, of the importance of migrants. I hope very much um, that, uh, that this will have, have an influence um, on, on us being aware of just how necessary migrants are. Uh, when borders are closed, when immigration regimes are stopped, when visas are not being processed, as is the case across much of the world today, uh, we realize just how much work is, is not being done. Um, one of the things that, that is being started to talk about just a little bit is the question of food security. Um, if this year's harvest is not, uh, if this year's crop is not harvested, if this year's crop is not planted, um, which I don't, I don't know where that stands, but that's certainly something that is, is uh, not, not completely outside the realm of possibility, uh, then, then we may have a real problem uh, going on. And a lot of that is, is migrant labor. Um, and that's certainly something that, that we really do need to, to, to think about. Um, just one other thing to mention in the United States, um, of course, health insurance uh, is linked to employment. Mm -hmm. um, and so everyone who has lost a job uh, now has, is in a very precarious state concerning uh, health insurance. There is a possibility of buying health insurance, but it's very expensive. Um, and many people who have just lost jobs will not be able to afford that. Um, and, and so that's something that uh, the U.S. government in mid-March uh, launched a campaign saying U.S. citizens abroad plan to return home now while you still can. Uh, many people, many U.S. citizens uh, who live and work abroad don't have health insurance in the United States. 
Um, and so regardless of whether they have caring responsibilities in the United States, uh, many of them are not daring to return home because they don't have health insurance there, but they might have health insurance abroad. Um, and that then that doesn't carry over to the United States. Um, so that's something certainly also when we think about um, access to health care um, and, and U.S. citizens who I've argued are migrants, um, then, then that's certainly something that we see that, uh, that everybody um, is affected by access to health care or not. I mean, I, I, a question that related to, to what you were saying has come on through from Anthony, and, and, and he, he's wanted to know whether there are possible solutions um, to this sort of um, question of the domestic constituency and the international interdependency. Do you see that the, we can find a way through those sets of co contradiction? Amanda, do you want to come in? And I can see Albena is going to yeah. um, also pick that point up. Go ahead, Albena. I love the way the, the point is formulated. I should take it down. Um, yes, there is there is a, a solution, and this is to have a different kind of European integration and different kind of globalization by stressing something that we have not talked so far about: institutional capacity to decide in terms of long term interest of the community because mm. democracies are very especially market democracies capitalist democracies are very much short-term oriented on the good life on on growth on uh, competition competitiveness and and things that deliver uh, immediate enrichment so we need a, a longer term decisional uh, capacity um, and it, curiously, I, I, I believe that we're seeing that shift in the much berated uh, European Commission. Now, immediately after the eruption of the pandemic, uh, the European Commission successfully organized the procurement scheme, which the UK government missed because they didn't see the message. Uh, so they, they organized a stockpile of medical equipment. Uh, they set up an unemployment reassurance scheme. These are all, the, all exactly the, the, the kind of stuff we need. You know, uh, public uh, welfare, longer term interest. The next step would be to take this crisis and then ensure the green transition. Unfortunately, there recently the European Commission said that there would not be strings attached to uh, the companies that are being bailed out, so to, to, to the loans mm -hmm. and grants. Um, and that's a missed opportunity, but uh, then member states are, are taking on um, that initiative. For instance, the Netherlands and, and, the, and France have said uh, that they would put conditionality for uh, the green, uh, to help the green transition. So th this is probably the, the, the answer would be, let us have the institutions that can take the longer term interest, even if it is against the immediate interest of the communities. So, so alternatives emerging. Amanda, do you want to, to, to come in on, on, on some of that? But, uh, because I, I also have a question here that's coming on the, the United Nations in relationship to, the, to that point. Um, and so I'll, I'll, I'll just read that one out from Sunil. What contribution can the United Nations system make in this situation? Will this crisis strengthen or weaken the UN system? Mm -hmm. But Alternative options, Amanda, and then I'll bring in Adrian. <laughs> All right, I just want to pick up one thing Alvina said, which is that uh, governments very often react to short-term issues. And that's one of the things that I often say about migration, is that migration and migrant integration, for instance, is not something that is solved in two, three, four, five, six years, right? And that's your typical term of an elected leader, um, is two to six years. Um, and something for migration is something that's a much longer term. Uh, integration academically is measured in generations. It's not measured in years. Uh, but in legislation, we see integration is a, it's a five year, typically a five year length of time. And so we really do need to have that much longer uh, scale um, to, to really look at how immigration and, and migration uh, works in a society. Mm -hmm. And on the UN system, I think there was, a, there was another question there was sort of saying what is working particularly well and what might be a, a mechanism um, for regulation. And I have to say that the UNHCR and the Refugee Convention is actually a component of the UN system. It's very heavily criticized, um, but it actually works really well. Um, that the, the Refugee Convention says that everyone has the right to file a claim for asylum. Nobody is granted the right to refugee status, but everyone is granted the right to file a claim and to have that claim individually evaluated. And that's something that's actually really, really important. And, and it is something that, again, it, is, it has 
enormous shortcomings. Um, but in terms of international agreements that are largely adhered to, it's actually quite a success story. Um, and that's something that I think moving forward, I think, I think it, it's, you know, it's gone through its ups and downs and it, and it continues to. Um, but that's something that I, that I think is one area where we do continue to see good international collaboration. Again, shortcomings all over, but, uh, but we do see good international collaboration on that. And that's certainly something that I think we'll continue to see going forward. Yeah, thank, thank you. Adrian, this question of the United Nations system, um, how, I mean, it's been challenged, but it's also had a key role. And I, I note that the UN Secretary General was saying that one of the difficulties of our times is this rupture between power and leadership. Do you think that uh, he's exposing some of, of the difficulty of cooperation and the precarity of the UN in that, in that challenge? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I mean, partly because for some time, and there's never a golden age in history, but certainly for some time, we've seen a, a growing gulf between power and purpose. You know, that, that often power, whether political or economic, has been seen as very self-serving. Uh, and, and, you know, a, a, a wider kind of social or moral purpose has not really been at the heart of, of you know, either national, uh, you know, governments or, or, or international organizations. So I think that that is a perennial problem, but certainly been highlighted again by this crisis. And then I suppose when, when it comes to the UN in particular, there's sort of two things. One is, you know, the UN, you know, as an, as an idea and as an ideal is, is a wonderful thing. And I don't think many uh, around the world would question the, the raison d'etre. The trouble is when it becomes very formal and doesn't have a substantive content, when there's no kind of animating purpose or vision, then it can easily be very abstract and it looks like a supranational thing that's imposing things on countries. So that's one danger. It goes back to the point I made about technocracy right at the start, you know, it can look very remote and, and abstract. Or else, when there is a purpose, it could just be that, you know, one dominant country or a small group of dominant countries rule the whole thing, i.e. the Security Council and its members, right? And or else you get paralysis then and nothing happens. So, you know, it's not a happy situation. So really what, what the UN needs, like other organizations, and I think the WHO itself has, you know, gone through a very difficult period because of, you know, the perception of very strong political pressures on it. You know, I think what we need to do is we need to find a way to, again, have a long term animating purpose that can be agreed upon, that can be nurtured by all so that, you know, these organizations generally matter. If they're just seen as instruments in the hands of some powerful countries or paralyzed because the powerful countries disagree or else devoid of any content, then it's going to be really, really difficult to see a way through. I mean, the question of, you know, reforming the UN Security Council has been on the agenda for a long time. I don't think that in itself will solve it. It's to try and find what is the common interest of very different countries around the world. And I think we can agree on things like ecological sustainability, right? Or we, at least we should. We can agree on things like resilience in terms of health and education and institutions. And then I think the next step will be also to say we don't want to choose between the national and the global. Because what about the local and the regional? Because you're not going to build up sustainability or resilience or you know, do any of the things we want to do unless you involve regions and localities. And I think supranational organizations have to also be seen to be on the side of regions and localities. They can't just be doing deals with national governments. That's just simply not enough. National governments don't have the knowledge. Right? They don't have always the interest of majorities at heart. And that's where supranational organizations need to be you know, more minded, I guess, you know, uh, in terms of the principle of subsidiarity, you know, devolving power and resources to the right level that's consistent with human dignity. That's really what's needed. A good sense of subsidiarity and solidarity and I entirely agree that often the most vulnerable groups are the ones that are most excluded from power, from wealth, from opportunity and that of course remains very much at the heart of the agenda. Yeah thank you Adrian. Uh, we have a lot of questions coming in and I just want to pick up on, the, on your points about the local and the, and the national and, and there are some questions here I mean it's it, I think very pertinent for the, the Brussels School of International Studies looking at all of the kind of global contexts and here is a question from Jamie how do you see the pan epidemic altering the relationship between African states and between African countries and the global north and another related question from Deepak in, in, in the countries like India which do not have a robust health infrastructure and populism reigns, uh, what do you think will happen? So there are specific nuances within uh, the context of, of African and, and, and in India. Anybody want to pick up that, that, that kind of question of how the specificness of the challenges within different um, 
in the global south to the global north. Amanda, do you want to pick up some of that? Sure, I can pick up on that. I was going to pick up on another question also that, that came through. I'll pick up on that in just a minute. Uh, I, mean, I mean, I think that, that Adrian just talked about, about uh, people who were excluded. And I mean, that's certainly something that, that around the world, uh, we have seen the Global South continue to be excluded um, from health. Um, is is one one big area, right? There are a lot of diseases that have been uh, eradicated in the global north that have not been eradicated in the global south. Tuberculosis is one of those. Polio is another, um, and that's something that I, I think when the global north you know, sort of was has been so shocked at the COVID nineteen pandemic is that there is somehow I mean nobody's really quite quite spoken it but you know but this isn't something that happens to the north you you can hear people saying um and this is you know that that uh, that there have been been pandemics before um and they have largely been limited to the global to the global south they have not spread to the global north um and that's something that this really is the real difference this time that this is global this is so there's something like uh, was it are we up to two-thirds of the world's population under under some kind of lockdown measure at this point in time that's staggering when was the last time that the entire world was 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 affected by the same thing at the same time when I mean, mm -hmm. terrorism has affected has affected large proportion of the world uh wars uh hunger uh but but at different points in time and and of course now this is something that's incredibly mediated by socioeconomic status by access to resources by inclusion um in in governance and and so forth but to some degree almost the entire world's affected by this. And that's just something that's staggering, right? Um, and so that's something that I, I mean, I, I think the, in, in many ways, I mean, this is something that I'll be in a better place to, to comment on uh, than I am, but I mean, but this idea of, of, yes, people who are excluded and who have poor health care to begin with are going to be disproportionately uh, affected. Um, the other thing I think, and this is something that this is one of the reasons, of course, for the lockdown is to allow government, uh, not government, sorry, uh, scientists and doctors um, to have more time to learn about this, this very unknown health threat, right? We just don't know enough right now. Um, what is, is this something that, that weather affects? Is this something that age affects? We just don't know right now. Um, and that's something that, that every day that goes by, we give the scientists and, 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 and medical doctors a chance to, to learn more. Um, and that's something that we're gonna be able to see um, what do, does different uh, healthcare systems, you know, what do different uh, medical practices? Um, that's something we don't, we don't quite know yet. Uh, so so that's, that's not, not too, too much of an answer, but, uh, but yes, I, mm -hmm. I think people will be disproportionately affected, um, but also we need to, to wait and see. I did also want to pick up on, on Robert's question. I don't know if, Albina, you wanted to comment on, on this at the moment, uh, um, or I... Well, well, just to, to, to throw in the comment about Africa and India, and uh, if uh, the, the pandemic has revealed something, is that even the financial health of, of uh, the weakest is in the um, interest of all. So we cannot afford to neglect anymore, um, you know, those who are falling out, because that affects everybody. So mm -hmm. that, that it will be a futile, um, futile exercise to strengthen our societies, but leave uh, you know the, the, the poor countries behind. Yeah. Okay. Th thank you, Amanda. You, uh, Amanda, you wanted to pick up a question from Robert there as a, th as a three-part question. Uh, do you want? Do you want to kind of? select which bit you want to respond to there. Sure, absolutely. Um, I was just going to pick up on the on the couple elements of that. One about the uh, increase in anti-globalization sentiments, um, and particularly with, with reference to China. I mean, that's something that's really, really interesting in the United States, right? Because um, the United States has outsourced most of its manufacturing to China. Um, and, and so that's uh, this idea of um, that there's negative sentiment in the United States uh, concerning um, concerning China um, and anti-globalization sentiments. And, and so the idea would be, uh, so, so we have outsourced much of our manufacturing to China. Um, and so that's something um, that now much of the employment in the United States is in the service industry. Um, and the service industry, restaurants, hotels, and so forth, are areas that are particularly negatively affected by, by the lockdown, by, by economic responses uh, to the pandemic. Um, so I think there is something to the anti-globalization. Um, and what that is, is the manufacturing needs to come back to the United States under safe distancing and, and, and so forth. That's something that at the moment, uh, we see the meatpacking plants in the United States being proportionately, disproportionately affected by um, 
by the uh, the pandemic, and I think that's something um, that uh, that that we need to uh, change a little bit um, on that uh, on that that approach. Um, you also pose a question about will universal basic income trap people um, in in poverty because it's simply too little for people uh, to live on, um, and that's something that that uh, is a fascinating question, um, and and I think there there's a lot behind that, um, and I think that that's something that uh, that I'll, I'll simply say the idea would be that that is a basic safety net, um, and in Europe there is a, a much stronger welfare system um, than there is in the United States, but even so, it's something that that's simply not enough. Um, and, and indeed, um, that's something that is really coming through um, in this point in time. Um, um, time to read. We've got not nine minutes left, um, and, and I just want to kind of pull a, a, a few things uh, together um, as we look to the future. And a, a few questions here, one from Inge, is about critique of the press um, on whether we need to be more critical about how this has been presented at, at, as a, as a crisis. And I want to link that to an, another question by Ken, who's asking whether the academics themselves need to present a more critical challenge politically. Adrian, do we need more critique of the presentation of this crisis? Well, I, look, I think absolutely, you know, we wouldn't want any part of society, whether it's uh, the, the, the free press uh, or indeed um, the academy or any uh, section of society to be in any way, uh, you know, silenced. And, and I think there are tendencies around biosurveillance that are, you know, potentially very, very problematic. I mean, it's great to say we want to check on people's health and, and protect the most vulnerable, and so we should. But what we certainly don't want to do is, you know, install or establish a permanent system of, you know, of total surveillance, where people's every single movement is tracked. Uh, you know, so there are, there are some real questions around, the, you know, how do we combine public health concerns with, with you know, individual um, sort of civil and other liberties? And of course, the press, uh, the academy and others should be speaking up for, for those, you know, for those liberties as well as for, for public protection. So th these are complex uh, questions. But yes, absolutely. We need certainly always a critical angle on whether it's government policy all media reactions or academic analysis, no one should be immune uh, from, from, from criticism whatsoever. At the same time, I think we don't want to engage in, in sort of critique for critique's sake, because there are also things that we do learn in the crisis, such as, for instance, you know, the sheer importance of public health that's been neglected, the, the desire for protection, right, the desire for stability and, and, and security and so on. And I don't think we want to be, you know, questioning all sorts of initiatives that are springing up just because we want to be critical. So, you know, it, 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 it's a difficult one, but I think common sense coupled with, you know, a critical disposition absolutely is, is vital in this and no one uh, should be exempt. I think some elements of the press, certainly in the UK, I think have been too far on one side, either cheering on, you know, the government as if the government had made no mistake whatsoever or else trashing everything the government comes up with. I mean, I think neither position is, is particularly persuasive. And I think it leaves a lot of people reading the British press very skeptical about who they can now trust, right? Because if the journalists are so biased either way, pro or anti-government, and it doesn't matter which, you know, uh, government of the day it is, then I think there are questions of public trust and we don't want trust to be further eroded because it's already very low. And I think that's another thing we need to bear in mind. How do we rebuild trust in, in public institutions? Yeah, thank, thank you. I, I, I'm, I'm aware that we have uh, only uh, about five minutes left and I want to go around each of you now because one of the questions that's coming is where do we go from here? Um, from Lauren, thank you for that question. And I, I, I guess the, the question is do we return to the old normal? Is there a new normal or are we going to take the challenge and open up new, as, as Albena was saying, green agendas and take this as an opportunity for world transformation. So the future, Albena, I'll begin with you. What, what happens next for the world? Okay. In, in we, we're, we're at a turning point. So we have seen the capacity of governments actually to act on, on a longer term, uh, to act in the longer term interest, although they're, they're putting down a specific fires, a crisis management. So that we could continue going in that direction. The problem is that now as governments are, um, you know, borrowing money to help out businesses, they're building so much um, uh, debt, 
that uh, they might get frightened of that and stop um, uh, you know the that direction of longer term investment so that is that is the the point that uh, that we need courage to continue in this direction yeah amanda uh, the future yeah. Uh, what the future holds. Uh, I mean, it's certainly something that, that uh, I, you know, at the moment, even where we have stopped visa processing, where we have stopped immigrant visas to the United States, uh, people are still moving. And I think the, the value of, of immigrants to our societies um, is perhaps becoming uh, ever, ever more clear. And I, I do hold out hope uh, that our, our new normal is, is one where, where the value of everyone to contribute to a society um, is, is recognized. Um, and that's not something that, that is on, on national lines uh, alone. I mean, I, I think this, this pandemic really has um, heightened up uh, divisions that we saw already. Um, it has compressed things um, and, and quite a lot has progressed very, very quickly over the last two months. Um, and that's something that, that it'll be interesting to see as, as things sort of return to a, a normal time frame, if, 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 if nothing else, um, you know, where exactly we, we go from here. And, and just realizing that uh, closing the borders to migrants uh, affects healthcare industries, affects agriculture industries, affects every industry. Um, and that's something that, that really does become very, very clear. Um, and, and that's something I, I think that, that more than anything else uh, that, that also shows the interconnectedness of our economies and the remittances that are sent back. Um, and so I, I, I like to think that the value of, of migrants to sending and receiving countries will continue to be recognized and, and even more strongly. Thank you, Mena. And Adrian, very quickly, what, what do, you, do you think that we're going to have a new normal or return to the old normal? I don't think we'll return to the old normal because I think there's now such a fear around contagion around, you know, uh, either second peak or, you know, or future pandemics. I think what will change is not just the politics in terms of globalization, you know, some of the border questions we've discussed, capitalism, technology. I think even more fundamentally, certain ways of life will not continue. So, you know, mass gatherings in the way that we have seen, you know, for a long time, you know, whether it's sports or entertainment and so on, they may just not resume in quite the same way or only for certain pockets of society rather than as a more generalized phenomenon. So I think it's at the, at the level of ways of life that we might see perhaps more change than even at the level of economic or, or political uh, institutions. And I think that will be an interesting thing to see. Is this sort of, you know, the, 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 the 40, 50 years of sort of progressive, you know, globalization may well have come to an end and we will realize in five or 10 years time that, that was a very different era, you know, say from Woodstock to, to Wuhan, you know, and, and, and now we are sort of, you know, in a new era where, you know, people are more fearful of mass gatherings, more fearful of certain things that they used to do. The private may become more important again, oddly. And either the private as something we cherish or the private as something that is even more closely surveilled. This can go in a number of directions. But I do think we are at one of those points in time where we could say BC, AC, before coronavirus, after coronavirus. Uh, a, a, a globally re redefining uh, moment. Um, thank you, Adrian. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Albana. Unfortunately, that takes us to the end of our webinar. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Um, pleased to say that we will continue these interdisciplinary interventions, imagine, reflect, and inspire. And our next uh, webinar will be on the 1st of June, and it will, it's entitled Literature, Life and Lockdown, How the Humanities Can Help the Species Survive. That's on the 1st of June. And we'll be continuing with a whole series of other webinars, picking up a range of themes in international politics and the humanities in the, the month of June. So please do join us then. Thank you again to Adrian Albena and Amanda. We look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you. Thank you.